Craig Hall. I'm the director of Lexington Community Education. Happy to be here with you tonight. This is the first talk of our winter 2020 term. Um, I need to thank Lex Media for filming tonight, uh, for broadcast at a later date on the uh, local Lex Media channel. Uh, also, thanks to Jim, Jimmy McFeely for helping me set up and welcome you here tonight. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you here to hear Brian David Burrell speak about his life and work as a Lexington-raised writer. Tonight's a bit of a homecoming as Brian grew up just about a stone's throw away, almost directly across the street from where we are here tonight. So welcome, welcome home. Uh, thanks for <laughs> taking time out of your schedule to, to visit. Um, you know, as a reader, I've always loved hearing about the development, devotion to craft, and day-to-day -day life of an author, uh, as the trajectory of an artist's career isn't usually cut and dry. Uh, and in examining an author's life, oftentimes the physical location that the writer grows up in and lives in plays a particular role in perspective, ambition, and the results of the writing. Brian David Burrell's life and career as a writer seems to have developed in this not so cut and dry way. Influenced by the history and the people of his Lexington launching pad, he appears to have followed the proverbial golden string that the poet and writer William Stafford, informed by William Blake, encouraged writers to take up that golden string leading from one thing to another and eventually to a place of fulfillment. From watching his father collect interesting historical and casual quotes in a notebook as a boy, to a good Lexington public school system experience, and then on to greater learning institutions uh, and research with construction jobs, I believe, and teaching jobs and math thrown in between. Uh, this following of the string eventually led Brian to an interest in neuroscience, to becoming a, in a, an authority on the elite brain and its connections, and to authoring books that include The Words We Live By, Postcards from the Brain Museum, Reaching Down the Rabbit Hole, and How the Brain Lost Its Mind, which we have copies of here tonight, uh, co-authored co with Dr. Alan Roper. So from teachings and meditations on what makes a good life, to mathematics, to the biology of brilliance, to exploring creativity, criminality, neurosis, and psychosis, the Lexington writer's life for Brian David Burrell is, by all accounts, a fascinating journey with great reward for us, his readers, and great respect for the town where it all began, uh, Lexington, Mass. Brian currently divides his time between lecturing in mathematics at UMass Amherst, conducting statistical research with neuroscientific applications, and, of course, writing with brilliance and clarity. He has appeared on the Today Show, C-SPAN's Book Notes, and NPR's Morning Edition. So it's a great honor to welcome you back to Lexington. Uh, we have a lot to get through. So without further ado, Brian David. Thank you, Craig. Um, when Craig invited me to give this talk, I chose a Lexington writer's life as a placeholder title, and I ended up sticking with it. But I thought it might require a little bit of explanation, um, because I haven't lived in Lexington for quite a while. I was born in Sims Hospital, not all that far from here, and actually initially grew up on Wachusett Drive over on the other side of Loring Hill, and then Child's Road up near the Old Stone Store. And then eventually, by high school, we moved to uh, just across from the Lexington Green with the old belfry looming over our backyard. But I went off to college in 1973 to the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and I'd come back in the summer times, but by the time the 70s were out, I was mostly gone from this town. And I relocated up to western Massachusetts. Um, I started teaching at UMass. I'm in the math department there. And I occupy an office high up in the graduate research tower, way down at the end of a hall, far away from the ebb and flow of daily campus life. And while there, I've written or co-written seven books. Um, and um, as I said, taught for 
close to 30 years. So in what sense am I a Lexington writer? Well, I'd like to make the case that I owe everything to Hancock School, Diamond Junior High, Lexington High School, and Cary Memorial Library. Um, and principally from the people who worked in those places during my time here. Uh, it was a very special time in, I mean, it's not the town we're standing in right now, of course. It's a town of that place and that time. Um, and I've brought with me a bunch of things today that I'm going to place into evidence before you to state my case, and I'll let you be the judge. <clears throat> but I want to begin with a story. Um, when I was asked to give this talk, I was thinking back over these books, and I remember going, this is 20 years ago, to Stockholm in search of some brains. So I mean that literally. I was going to Stockholm to find um, a particular collection of brains. And I flew in from London, and I um, went into the city, and I found myself a bunk in a floating hostel uh, that was um, moored just to the west of the bridge that goes over to Gamlestan, which is the old center city. And once I got situated, the next day I ventured out to the Karolinska Institute, just in the outskirts of town. And I was there to meet a man named Gunnar Grant, who was a professor of anatomy. And he was going to take me to the historical collections of the Institute, where we were both brought into a sitting room. And we sat down at a coffee table, and we were served tea and cookies, and they two assistants brought in these two very large jars containing human brains. Um, one of them belonged to Gustav Retzius, who died in 1919, and the other belonged to Gustav Fruding, who died in 1911. Retzius was an anatomist. He was the one who studied and removed, in fact, the brains that I had come to see. These were not the brains I had come to see. Uh, Gustav Fröding, if you've never heard of him, is sort of like the national poet of Sweden. They're Robert Frost in some ways. He modernized Swedish poetry, but he was also in and out of insane asylums during his life, and he died in one. Um, two interesting pieces of information come, came out of this visit. One was that the Institute had no idea that they had these brains until I asked about them and said um, I was coming over. And then they rummaged down in their storage closets and they found these two brains. Again, not the ones I was looking for. But they were somewhat uh, embarrassed by this because the brains were in pretty bad shape. So they took them out of the original jars. They put them into brand new jars with new preservative fluid. And in fact, they threw out the old jars as far as they could tell and, and with them the labels. In other words, they removed every vestige of interesting research material that, that I wanted to find in this place. And it was all very nice sitting around drinking tea and looking at these two brains, but they really didn't tell you much because brains tend not to. One brain in a jar looks pretty much like the other. You really want to see the label. It's kind of like a diamond. You'd like to see the setting, but there was no setting here. Um, I was kind of tempted to say, you know, what, 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 do you, what the hell do you think you were doing? Um, the preservative fluid, the label, I, I even would, would want to see the shelf they were stored on. Um, one other thing came out of this, and that was uh, a little bit later when we went over to the Hagerstromer Library and I was introduced to another professor, and we were there to talk about the life and the work of Gustav Retzius. And in doing so, I had to explain what I was doing there, which means I had to um, talk about the fact that I was traveling across Europe in search of lost brains. Um, much, in fact, I was reminded in Nikolai Gogol's book, Dead Souls, Chichikov, the main character, goes across Russia buying up dead souls. This is what I felt like. In any event, the man I was there to meet, the professor at one point in the conversation when he heard what I was doing, said, have you seen the head of Antonio Scarpa? And I said, no, I hadn't. And he says, well, you must. You must see the head of Antonio Scarpa. 
course, it had absolutely nothing to do with what I was researching because the head of Antonio Scarpa still, well, within the skull contained the brain. You couldn't see the brain somewhere. This head existed. But the fact is I had to see it. All of this, I imagine, sounds kind of bizarre. Uh, even at the time, it sounded kind of bizarre to me. And so the question arises, how did I get myself into this in the first place? So let's go back a bit. Uh, 1963, second grade Hancock School, right over there. <clears throat> I'm called out of class one day, and I'm brought into a small office where I sit down with this man who begins to ask me some questions. And I only remember two of them, but I remember being there for a while. Question number one, he states that a man leaves his house in the morning and he goes uphill to work. And at the end of the day, he walks uphill back home. Is this possible? And of course, I, I, well, I didn't say, of course not. I was a shy kid, but I explained why this was not possible. So then he gets out a piece of paper and he says, you know that sort of gray, pulpy, unlined paper we used in grade school that would write on with crayons? Anyway, he folds it in half and he says, if I fold this paper in half, I create two rectangles. He said, if I fold it again, how many rectangles? Four. If I fold it again, eight. Again, 16, 32, and he keeps folding until he can't fold anymore and it's just a wad of paper. He throws it away and then we keep going. It's probably some paper and pencil things, fill in the bubbles, and then I leave. And I go back to class and I forget all about it until the following school year, day one in the playground. Hancock School, the big swings, seesaw, the monkey bars that somehow never killed us. But anyway, the bell rings. And I mean, of course, it's been two months. I hadn't seen all my friends. We're out playing in the playground. Everything's going great. And the bell rings and we're, we go into our classroom and sit down there I am among all my friends when Mrs. Delcy singles me out and she says, you are not in this class. And I said, what? And she said, no, you're in the AP class with Miss Kubishevitz. You have to go upstairs. AP, it's like two scarlet letters on my forehead, <laughs> a mark of shame. I have to get up in front of all my friends and skulk out of the classroom and go find this Miss Kubishevitz who I don't know and I don't know anyone in the class. They've been bussed in from Fisk, from Hastings, from Estabrook, maybe even from Monroe. Anyway, I managed to survive this. Um, SRA, film strips, book reports, the year goes by. And then the next year comes around fourth grade and I'm in Mr. Hathaway's classroom. Still AP the scarlet letters, but now I know a few more of my classmates and we're in the basement classroom over in Hancock School. The basement classroom, one wall of windows faces Clark Street, the other wall of windows faces the front, Forest Street. There are these casement windows down there with slightly arched tops and underneath them, Mr. Hathaway, my teacher, has installed pine bookshelves that line the two walls. And the bookshelves are chock full of paperback books, two full walls through. And in my memory, which of course could be faulty in this case, it seemed to me that we had more books in the classroom than they had in the school library, which was just up the stairs and around the corner. But our classroom didn't have Stuart Little, and it didn't have Make Way for Ducklings, and it didn't have any Caldegott or Newbery Award winning books. Instead, it had things like Edna Ferber and Erskine Caldwell and the Organization Man. And in fact, the Organization Mad, if you remember the Mad Magazine paperbacks. In fact, it was Mr. Hathaway's personal book collection. And on page 100 of every single book in that room, he had signed his name up at the top. We knew that because we checked. <laughs> All of the books were available to us to read. <clears throat> I don't know if this would be allowed today. Um, <clears throat> ah, sorry, I sold a piece of paper. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Hathaway's classroom was sort of a, like the world in microcosm. We did units on ancient Mesopotamia, on Beowulf, 
on the Dust Bowl. We studied the new math. I didn't understand the new math. I don't think Mr. Hathaway understood the new math. Somehow we did it. I recently came across one of the new math books in our department and I looked at it and I still don't understand the new math. But anyway, we survived that. Uh, the fact is we were surrounded by a wealth of knowledge in that classroom. I was in it for two years, fourth and fifth grade. Um, and I was also surrounded by a brace of very knowledgeable teachers. And my, a lot of my classmates were the children of professors. Some of them the children of architects, collaborative architects. Some of them of cold warriors who worked out on Route Run 28 um, in the, the tech sector. One day, Mr. Hathaway brought in a record album. <clears throat> I offer this as Exhibit A. <clears throat> Herb Alpert's Whipped Cream and Other Delights. He brought this into the class when he said, you've got to hear this. He says, I've never heard anything like it. Of course, it's got this cover art on it as well. We had never seen anything like it, but he took it out of the sleeve and he put it on the record player and he propped it up on his desk in front of the class and he played Taste of Honey. I think he played the whole side. <clears throat> Not long after that, that album showed up in our house. My father bought it. Um, enthusiasm for that particular album seemed to spread like a contagion for men of a certain age. Um, so among other things in our house, there was something else that drew my interest at the time. And I will offer this up as Exhibit B. So it looks like a very large, sort of well-worn three-ring binder, maybe along the lines of a scrapbook. It says on it, Oaths and Creeds and Other Works Americans or People Live By. <clears throat> so when I was in grade school, this is in my father's office, and I used to peruse it frequently. The Rotary Creed, um, Clemency Oaths, Mottos, um, Johnny Carson's Three Rules of Comedy. Tell them what you're going to do, do it, tell them what you've done. Arthur Treacher's Three Rules for Playing in the Theater. Say the words, take the money, go home. <laughs> <clears throat> um, when I was in grade school, even in junior high, I thought this would make a great book. And I thought one day my father would write it. But he didn't, so I did. Um, let me, I just want to read you a little bit from the introduction to this. Exhibit C. <clears throat> On a cold, dreary evening in the early spring of 1962, a man parked his rented car near the Robert Taft Memorial in Washington, D.C. Turning to his six-year-old son in the seat behind, beside him, he said, wait here, I'll be right back. Whereupon he grabbed a notebook and dashed over to the base of the monument. As the young boy patiently waited, his father took out a pen and began to copy down the words inscribed in the stone while shielding his paper from the light rain. When he was finished, he walked back to the car, handed the notebook to his son, and they drove off. On subsequent business trips over the next decade, often with one child or another in tow, the same scenario was repeated in all kinds of weather, all times of day and night. Gradually, the father's collection began to fill a folder and then a large white loose leaf binder. In addition to inscriptions from monuments and included legends and trivia from the placemat menus of roadside diners, mottos printed on the backs of postcards from historic sites and newspaper clippings about oaths and pledges. It also contains some outlandish fraternal initiation formulas, codes of ethics of florists and knitted underwear manufacturers, and such esoterica as the statement of purpose of the Barnstable Mass Babe Ruth League. The wondrous collection bore the title The Words People Live By, and it seemed to encompass the wisdom of the ages, the secrets of the temple, indeed the very fabric of civilization. From time to time, the boy would have occasion to reflect on the words in the, full, in the notebook. For example, one night on the village green at Lexington, the Vietnam veterans against the war staged a rally and were arrested along with what seemed like half the town. 
It all happened across the street from the boy's house just outside his bedroom window in what is called the birthplace of American liberty. At the edge of the scene, where that night the school buses were lined up to cart away the protesters, there is a rock inscribed with the words, well, inscribed with Captain John Parker's order to the Minutemen on April 19, 1775. The boy knew it by heart. Stand your ground, don't fire unless fired upon, but if they mean to have a war, let it begin here. A few years later, the boy went off to college. While he was away, one president resigned, and another president who had been sworn in to restore America's faith in the Constitution came to Lexington to commemorate the bicentennial. He gave a speech at the foot of the Minuteman statue, which just happened to be across the street from the boy's father's office in which the white binder sat on the bookshelf gathering dust. It took me a long time to get that published. Um, and during that time, I learned one crucial thing, which was how to write a book proposal that sells. Um, I don't have an easy formula for that. It, um, let's just say it was a very, very long string of failures and false starts, 15 years worth, in fact, during which time I went off to graduate school thinking it would afford me a lot of extra time to write. <laughs> I managed to sell this in 1995 to Adam Bellow, who was uh, editor-in-chief of the Free Press at Simon & Schuster. Um, he came to my attention because he'd just been profiled in The New Yorker. Bello was one of this new uh, breed of neocons back in the 90s. And um, had the publishing house was beginning to reflect that. And I thought, oh, I can pitch that this, uh, this book this way. And so I did. Um, and Bellow called it the best book proposal he had ever written. I uh, read, sorry. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, he called it Neo Burkean. And I had no idea what he meant by that, but I nodded my head and went along with it because they were giving me money and I was going to write the book and I could pretty much write whatever I wanted, neocons or no. <clears throat> um, and it did fairly well. I did get on the Today Show with Katie Couric, an hour with Brian Lamb on book notes, an hour with Diane Rehm on NPR, an hour with Mary Madeline and all kinds of other interviews. But I have to say, all of those hours add up to 15 minutes, your 15 minutes of fame, and they go by quickly. So a few years later, I'm back in my tower office at UMass. And I'm sitting at my desk not doing much of anything. I still read a lot. Um, but down in the, my office at the end of the hall, I tend to do crossword puzzles at the end of the day after teaching. And I have no idea for a new book. Not much interest in going through the process again of writing one. And then the phone rings. And I have to say, I hate it when the phone rings in my office, because unlike at home, I'm obliged to pick it up. And uh, it's Adam Bellow. And Adam says, I've just moved over to Doubleday, and I'm building up an author list. And I was wondering if you were working on anything. Miss Benevich was my 11th grade English teacher, one of the best teachers I've ever had. Um, every single week, she used to bring in the Boston Globe to read to his George Frazier's column. I don't know if you remember George Frazier, but he started out with the Herald as a jazz critic, and he moved over to the Globe, and he used to write about the literary life, about culture, about books, about writers, about art, and still about jazz. And he was a brilliant writer, and he had a very entertaining column. He made Nixon's enemies list. One of his favorite words was sprezzatura. Sprezzatura is an Italian word, and it comes from the courtier, which is by Baltasar Castiglione. I had read it in order to write that book. Um, sprezzatura is basically a kind of nonchalance, an, unsteady, an unstudied nonchalance in doing fairly difficult things. It's an attitude. It comes in handy if you are a courtier. So 
It was with some sprezzatura that I owe to Ms. Benevich that I answered Adam by saying, yes, I am working on something. I tell you what, let me write it up for you and then we can talk it over. And of course I had nothing except this. This had come across my desk not much earlier than that, a few months maybe. June 1999, the medical journal, The Lancet, prestigious British medical journal, The Exceptional Brain of Albert Einstein by Sandra F. Whittleson, McMaster University. This had been bothering me. So apparently Einstein's brain was different than your brain or my brain. Now, this sort of um, belies the fact that everybody's brain is different from everybody else's anyway. But Einstein, his exceptional intellect in these cognitive domains, and the author lists them, visuospatial cognition, mathematical thought, imagery of movement, these cognitive domains and his self-described mode of scientific thinking may be related to the atypical anatomy in his inferior parietal lobules. Um, let's see. Yes, um, where are the lobules? Ah, yes. Increased expansion of the inferior parietal regions is also noted in other physicists and mathematicians. For example, for both the mathematician Gauss and the physicist Siliostrom, extensive development of the inferior parietal regions, including the supramarginal gyrite, was noted. This, as I saw it, was a disaster. First of all, very unscientific paper, but any student who would come to me from thenceforth and say, I just don't have a brain for mathematics, had only to wave this in my face. I'm sorry, but it's my inferior parietal lobules. The supermarginal gyrus is just not up to the calculus. <clears throat> so, um, I wasn't happy. And I went to Bello and I said, how about this? How about a book about the fact that genius does not spring fully formed from the brain, but instead usually is a combination of some talent but incredible drive and a lot of hard work. Usually a formative period, uh, which is underemphasized in the bi biographical record. Mozart, Picasso, Einstein, you see this in all of their biographies, the incredible amount of training that went into it. Um, two years before this, David Remnick was not the editor-in-chief of the New Yorker magazine. In fact, he was a staff writer and Tina Brown was the editor. He came out to Amherst College to give a talk. And um, during this talk, he told a little anecdote which intrigued me and I've carried around with me ever since. He, they were sitting at an editorial meeting, in other words, Tina Brown at the head of the table, all the staff writers and editors, and they go around pitching stories, for, uh, pitching ideas for stories. And when it came time um, for Remnick, he said, I want to go out to Las Vegas and I want to cover the Tyson-Holyfield fight. And Tina Brown looked at him and rolled her eyes and said, ah, oh, Running and jumping, who gives a shit? And Remnick, of course, is, well, but he's not so totally daunted by this, and he says, I really think we need to cover this. And she finally relents and sends him out to Las Vegas. And I don't know if you recall, but basically within 24 hours of Remnick arriving at the hotel in Las Vegas, a gun battle breaks out in the lobby between the camps of Tyson and Holyfield, and not long after that, Mike Tyson bites off a portion of Evander Holyfield's ear during the fight, and as soon as Remnick gets back to the hotel, Tina Brown is on the phone and she's saying, how soon can you get me your copy? <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so I present my idea to Bello about genius. I don't know, you know, reading, writing, who gives a shit? He doesn't put it like that, but that's essentially what he's saying. But he is intrigued by one thing, and he says, well, what about this Einstein brain? 
He says, you mean there were other brains? And I said, well, yeah, yeah, there's collections. It was a big thing back then. These things are out there. And he said, well, how soon can you get me that? So I wrote it up. Uh, <clears throat> now, this, for ammunition, I had this in hand. Exhibit E. A study of the brains of six eminent scientists and scholars belonging to the American Anthropometric Society, Edward Anthony Spitzka, Transaction to the American Philosophical Society, New Series, Volume 42, 1906. In this paper, Spitzka has assembled a list of 130 brains and brain weights of men and women, chronological order, for example, Beethoven, um, deep and numerous fissures, brain not preserved. Franz Joseph Gall, creator of phrenology, uh, small brain, thick skull, not preserved. Um, okay, here's an interesting one. Gaetano Donizetti, Italian composer, died in Bergamo in 1848 of, note the words, paralytic dementia, Brain weight, 1391 grams. Carl Gauss and a bunch of others in the Göttingen collection. Robert Schumann, at about 44 years of age, became melancholy and attempted suicide. It doesn't say it here, but I'll tell you, paralytic dementia. They're not here either, but Franz Schubert, paralytic dementia. Friedrich Nietzsche, paralytic dementia. I'll come back to that later. Um, who else do we have here? Charles Babbage, London Collection, pristine specimen. Saw it before I went to Stockholm. Ivan Turgenev, Russian novelist and poet. 2,012 grams, biggest one in the, on record, practically. Huge brain. Uh, Biedrich Smetana, the Bohemian composer, died 1884 in the course of a paralytic dementia. Walt Whitman, American poet. The weight of Walt Whitman's brain is variously given as 45.2 ounces or 43.3 ounces. His stature was six feet and in health, he weighed about 200 pounds. The brain had been preserved, but some careless attendant in the laboratory let the jar fall to the ground. It is not stated whether the brain was totally destroyed by the fall, but it is a great pity that not even the fragments of the, of the brain were preserved. Ah, precursor of Igor in Young Frankenstein. In fact, quite possibly the inspiration. Finally, Carlo Giacomini, Italian anatomist, the Turin Collection. They preserve not just his brain, but everything. His skeleton, the brain, the viscera, huge jar, all in one display case. And finally, his face preserved in liquid in a jar in the display case. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, I write up a proposal and it sells. Um, postcards for the Brain Museum. Exhibit E. <clears throat> I dedicated this book to Mr. Hathaway, my fourth and fifth grade teacher. Um, it says here, if I can find it. Uh, ah, for James Hathaway, teacher, who taught me to think. So notice that it doesn't say you taught me how to think or taught me what to think. He taught me to think about things. Um, an observation. Events occur in real time and they're witnessed uniquely by each observer. So sometimes an observer will record the events or recount them in words and it becomes a story. Then it's no longer strictly factual but rather evocative. Um, my telling of my so-called writer's life is an example of that. So did everything happen exactly the way I'm describing it? Well, no, memory is faulty. But did it, these things happen essentially 
in that way? And the answer would be yes. So if I wanted to be particularly evocative, I could paint this thing as some sort of Nicolas Cage movie in which I went across Europe and the US with a treasure map in my possession to track down all of these brains. And in some ways it was kind of like that because I did go to see the head of Antonio Scarpa, which is in a hidden cabinet that you need special access to in a museum in Pavia. Or uh, down in Turin, I went to see the brain of Cesare Lombroso, the criminal anthropologist, whose face is also preserved in a jar by a door, literally in a mothballed anthropological collection down in Turin. At the time, I'm simply walking through all these events and I'm registering impressions. Um, and I wrote them up um, pretty much in a straightforward way with one exception, let's say. <clears throat> now, this thing should really be read by Alan Cumming. And I can't do a Scottish accent. The only thing I can do is I can arch an eyebrow in that way he does at the beginning of Masterpiece Mystery, the way he stands kind of like this. And he says something along these lines. Caveat. If you've never explored the recesses of an anatomical museum, brace yourself. It takes some getting used to. It is not so much the sight of it, the shock of the uncanny, as Freud described the contemplation of familiar objects in unfamiliar settings as the smell of it. Not the smell of death, as you might expect, or even a reassuring width of decay, which at least promises an eventual end to things, but a smell that reneges on any hope of oblivion. It is formaldehyde, a fixative so powerful that it does to living cells what the pause button on a remote control does to pixels and it does not discriminate. It will do the same thing to the skin of a careless anatomist that it does to the specimen he is preparing. And when you first walk into a closet of preserved human brains, it will smell as though it wants to do the same thing to you. <laughs> I wrote that one afternoon in my office up in the tower down the hall at the end of a long day when I had a complete manuscript, the same was true for the words we live by. In both cases, I thought something was missing, some little something to bring the reader in. And I tossed in each of those cases those things off in a very short amount of time and with very, needing very little editing. And they, um, they, held the, they ended up anchoring the books. So, Fast forward five years. It's now hard for me to recall what uh, Postcards was all about. Adam Bello used to say, simple, famous brains in jars. Four words, famous brains in jars. It's like white punks on dope. It's just very appealing. People can grasp it instantly. Uh, and at the time, Bello and I are tossing back and forth a few ideas for books, and neither one of us is really thinks much of them. So maybe my writer's life is over. And um, it's late one afternoon in the office and I'm probably doing Sudoku puzzles. The teaching day is over. And an email comes in from Brigham and Women's Hospital. The senior neurology resident is writing to ask me if I would be willing to come to a book club meeting in Newton at the home of one of the professors and faculty members. It is the Neurology Book Club of Mass General and Brigham and Women's, the partners group. My initial thought is to decline. I don't really feel like driving all the way out there, but I, you know, in the back of my mind, I think about Mr. Hathaway and I think about Ms. Benevich and I think about Mr. Wilson my 10th grade World Civ teacher for whom I wrote the paper on the failure of the Edsel and the bankruptcy of the Penn Central Railroad. And I thought, well, okay, maybe I should. It was during spring break anyway. So I agreed and I showed up and there were about 40 people there and they are 
very accomplished professionals that I'm somewhat intimidated. Um, 40 of them or so, medical residents, faculty members, experts on the human brain, what am I? Well, I'm the author of this book, and it turns out that no matter how educated your audience, when you go to talk to them about your book, you're going to know more than anyone there about it. Um, and it actually doesn't even matter, because all that really matters is that at the end of the evening, you sit down and you sign their books for them, and everyone goes home happy. And on the way out, the host, Dr. Alan Roper, one of the foremost clinical neurologists in the country, said to me, how'd you like to come in and uh, visit me in the hospital, come into my office? Well, yeah, uh, but you know, people say things like that. You know, you meet people at a gathering and they say things like, uh, well, you know, the next time you're in Bermuda, you really have to drop in. You know, we're in the book. You know, it's just their way of getting out the door. So I said to him, um, do you mean it? Because I'd like to come in. And he said, call my secretary. And I did. <clears throat> ah, exhibit F. Reaching down the rabbit hole. Not much needs to be said about this, except that I ended up shadowing Dr. Roper at Brigham and Women's Hospital over um, on and off over a period of a year in the neurology inpatient ward, in the neurology outpatient wards or clinics, in the emergency room, down in the morgue, morning report. <clears throat> and I tape recorded everything with permission, of course. And at the end of each day, Dr. Roper and I would have long conversations that I would transcribe. And at some point in all of this, I turned to him and I said, I think we have a book here. And we did. Um, another proposal, this one went to say, the several bidders went to St. Martin's Press, bingo, we've got another book. Um, I'll read a little bit from this. Early days on the ward, this is all verbatim dialogue. Hello, I'm, I'm Dr. Alan Roper. How are you? Well, uh, that's a grammatical question. Plus and minus. Is your mind clear? I guess so. There are a lot of unexplained issues around me, but I'm communicating appropriately. His name is Dr. Vandermeer. He is in his mid-80s, and he is a genuine Boston Brahmin. I know his type well. Over the past 50 years, he's built a national reputation as a top drawer researcher a uh, caring physician universally admired, all the while taking somewhat heedless care of his own body. He is a man of arts and sciences, but also a man of tastes and habits, acquired from his father and grandfather, which is to say that he is a 19th century Yankee, living a 20th century life in the 21st century, and is only a vaguely aware that he can no longer manage in the 10-room house he has occupied for the last 52 years. When he retired in his 70s, he settled upon a daily routine that failed to anticipate his declining faculties. He is as, as unwilling to accept this fact as he is to acknowledge the unruliness of his eyebrows or his surplus of nose and ear hair, a clinical indifference that is not unusual in aging doctors. Do you know where you are? Um, at Brigham and Women's Hospital. The date? Hmm, the date. No, I couldn't give you that. Year? Again, it's such a confusing sequence of events that it has confounded to me where my, where my orientation isn't what it should be. No problem. Are you in any pain? No. Doc Vandermeer was brought here over his own objections after his wife found him sitting on the toilet some seven hours after he had ventured from bedroom to bathroom. He had spent the night there. Have you had any hallucinations? No, I, I don't think so, but then people generally don't. Touche. Have you had any convulsions? No. And you know this about this meningioma in your right temporal lobe? You have a meningioma there about the size of a lemon. Were you aware of that? 
Uh, yes, I've had two growth issues that are pertinent. One is in the pancreas, the other is there. But you seem a little off cognitively, and our struggle is, could it be the meningioma that's doing it? Well, as they say, that's your problem. He's right, it is my problem. So we wrote that book from Alan's point of view. <clears throat> In the 10th grade, Mr. Wilson, in World Civ, told us to read a Russian novel. Pick one, he said. The easy way out would have been Turgenev. Huge brain, small book, fathers and sons. But of course, this is still AP. So Karen Agresti has to pick the brothers Karamazov. Which brother is your favorite? You know, others pick Crime and Punishment. Um, Anna Karenina, I chose Dead Souls by Nikolai Gogol, some 575 pages. Very uh, entertaining, pastoral, funny, satiric. This civil servant, Chichikov, he goes in his troika out from estate to estate and he's buying up dead souls with the intention of mortgaging them later on. So he's a scam artist. 500 pages in 10th grade, it's a lot, but anyway, you know, how will it end? Well, I'll tell you how it ends. I turn to the last page, and it ends with an ellipsis. And in square brackets and Italian, italics, the words that say, here the manuscript ends. I'll never forget that. Gogol apparently intended to write a sequel. You know, sometimes you think it's worth doing a sequel, but he did write quite a bit of a sequel, and he ended up throwing it away. And the work as it's, it really does still stand as a whole. He said pretty much what he wanted to say. So sometimes you do a sequel and sometimes you don't. Alan and I talked about this. We had a book that was fairly successful, uh, BBC Book of the Week, uh, one weekend Sunday Times, Times of London bestseller. And you can always do a sequel, but um, I don't know. I was vacillating about all of this, the thought of another project of that magnitude. It does eat up your life, it eats up your social life, it eats up your work life. And Alan was cutting back in his clinical practice and he'd just become deputy editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. So anyway, back in my tower office down at the end of the hall with my Sudoku puzzles, I was not all that enthusiastic and the phone rings and of course I have to pick it up and it's Alan and he says, let's do a book about neurosyphilis. And I said, what's that? So what I found out, what he meant was let's do a book about paralytic dementia. The thing that did in these musicians and artists and authors and all kinds of people in fact because what he was talking about was syphilitic dementia. But at the same time, I thought, neurosyphilis, I don't know. Infection and suffering, who gives a shit? Uh, there had to be more to it. And in fact, there was more to it, a lot more to it. And I discovered that if you did understand the story of neurosyphilis, that you would understand about a lot of other things, mesmerism, hypnotism, the birth of psychoanalysis, for that matter, the birth of the fields of psychiatry and neurology, how they ended up splitting apart, how they ended up splitting apart over the nature of mental illness. What is the nature of schizophrenia, of bipolar illness, of Tourette syndrome, all of these things. Of course, the reason that Spitzka in that article is using the term paralytic dementia is that he's writing in 1906 and neurosyphilis does not exist because they don't know that it is syphilis causing this. It takes about 100 years or, well, maybe 90 years from the identification of this condition, paralytic dementia, general paresis of the insane, as it was also called or still called. Uh, and they figured out that it had to do with syphilis. So we had to write about this. It's a bit of a tough entree though, because not many people know what neurosyphilis is anyway. 
And so I found that the entree into this was a painting, a painting in Paris. If you were to Google the word hysteria, or even the word hypnosis, I think, you would probably see this picture come up. It's a very large painting that shows a room full of men watching as a somewhat scantily clad woman is being put under hypnosis in order to induce a series of hysterical attacks. It was painted in 1887. And I realized I had to go see that painting if I were going to write about it, if I were going to use it in the book. And so I ended up, because time was pressing, doing a 36-hour trip to Paris, basically to see this one painting. And I'll just read a very small snippet of what came from that. On a warm Paris afternoon in late spring, throngs of weary tourists swarm to the narrow streets off the Boulevard Saint-Michel in search of a place to unwind after a day spent in the grueling pursuit of checklist tourism. Led around by docents and modern-day Bedekers, most of these vacationers have dashed through a handful of the city's five-star attractions, waved selfie sticks while plugged into audio tours, and can now be seen flowing into the Place Saint-Michel in a movable feast, fanning out across the sidewalks and down the clogged alleyways, feeding into the Rue de la Huchette. Just around the corner from this bustling warren of conviviality, one of the most historically significant artworks in the city goes unnoticed, unvisited, and unappreciated. Sheltered in a vestibule of a stately neoclassical building, it presides over an oasis of solitude and calm. Because none of the guidebooks mention it, very few people are even aware it exists. It is a large painting, and over the century and a quarter since it was painted, it has lost its notoriety, but not its significance. To understand this one painting is to understand everything that went wrong in the modern concept of mind and brain. It portrays nothing less than the original sin of neurology and psychiatry, from one from which we are still trying to recover. <clears throat> I now come to my closing argument. Um, I've heard it said that we emerge from high school as fully formed individuals. Um, that is, we become who we are destined to be at the end of 12th grade. Our essential self has been formed. I tend to agree with this. Um, in our 12 years in Lexington schools, we lived through some turbulent times within the walls, but not entirely sheltered. Uh, by them, assassinations, the Harvard Square riots, the Vietnam veterans against the war. Um, <clears throat> John Kerry came and spoke to us at that time in the Science Building Auditorium. Um, while we learned computer programming and calculus and technical drawing, French, economic theory, world history, Russian novels, our teachers were themselves pushing the boundaries of their own knowledge. That's how we wound up with an IBM computer, a massive IBM computer, an H unit uh, that took up a third of the, the room. And we wound up with classes in BASIC and FORTRAN. It's also why I was somewhat disappointed, at least initially, when I arrived at the University of Pennsylvania with the level of instruction there. I didn't think it was as good as Lexington High School. Anyway, I'll leave you with a vignette. One day in my English class, 11th grade, Mr. Murray, another English teacher, came in to sub for Miss Benevich. He brought with him a copy of Robert Frost's prose poem, The Death of the Hired Man. So this is a long prose poem, about 10 pages long. And I still remember two lines from it. Uh, one of them says that home is the place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. And then later there's a rejoinder to this that Home is the place you haven't to deserve. So Mr. Murray um, read this poem, and um, near the end of the poem, he was moved to tears by this thing. Um, he didn't try to hide it. 
And I remember being somewhat stunned, thinking, a man has just cried in front of us, a teacher no less. And of course, you're at that age in 11th grade where you're kind of on the fence about these things between kind of making fun of people, but at the same time, before that thought could even take hold, to just witness this performance, which struck me as being courageous and brilliant at the same time. Mr. Murray had memorized this entire thing. He had internalized it. He was not just reading us a poem. He was presenting it. He was embodying this thing. And it was very dramatic. Um, and it meant a lot to me at the time, and it occurred to me later that we moved a couple steps closer toward adulthood that day. I don't think he intended that. That was his purpose coming in, but that's what he accomplished. It meant a lot to me. Um, those impressions and others like it I carried beyond Lexington High School and into the books I wrote. I dedicated this last book to Miss Benevich. Alan had written his own dedication to his mentor at Mass General, Dr. Raymond Adams. And he wrote, for Dr. Raymond D. Adams, master clinician and author of the definitive book on neurosyphilis, who taught that there was only one brain and it belonged to both neurology and psychiatry. So I wrote for Jenny Benevich, who taught us for a while, allowed us to see particular things, and then sent us on. I rest my case. Thank you. <laughs> so we have time for some questions. There are some books, the, the, the latest one, How the Brain Lost Its Mind, on the table in the back if you're interested. But um, are there any questions about, yes? Who is the painter of this painting you mentioned in Paris? Andre Brie. Brie was um, an academic painter, and he exhibited the sal that painting at the sal Paris Salon in 1887. It was one of the most popular paintings there. Yes? I was just wondering if you've ever thought about what the first book, Words to Live By? Is the words people well, we live by. We live by. Have you ever thought about how you would write a sequel to that? <laughs> Um, a, you know, a lot of these books just seem to me something that you, you conceive and do and that's it. They, um, you know, I thought a lot about my father and writing this book and what he had intended. And it didn't come out to be the kind of book that he had intended. He just wanted kind of a straight reference book. But I realized this needed some explication. Uh, where do these words come from? How have their meanings changed over time? That sort of thing. So there is that collection at the back half of this thing that just lists a whole bunch of stuff that he had collected. But the text um, was really quite specific, and so I didn't feel any need afterwards. I felt I had answered this question. Um, and of course, the other thing is, you know, do you get asked to do a sequel? So we tossed around an idea of doing a spin-off type of thing, and I ended up writing one that I didn't mention here because it wasn't all that successful. It was a book about battle orders, military orders, things like that, and the stories behind them. What really happened? What does history leave us? You know, and what really happened? You know, when legend becomes fact, print the legend, right? The man who shot Liberty Valance. So anyway, um, but no, no sequel. <laughs> yes. A <laughs> good question. <clears throat> I have wound up being an, uh, the authority on a bunch of things. For example, Walt Whitman's brain. Apparently, I am the authority on Walt Whitman's brain and what happened to it. So let me be more specific about that. I am not a brain scientist. I'm not an anatomist. So I can't explain about the workings of the brain, say, in the way that Alan can. What it means is simply that I tracked down all the brains on that list and many others. And I know the stories of all of them and the, the, the motivation 
um, that drove all of those collections. There were these mutual autopsy societies back in the 1880s. And at that time, people were trying to see if there was some relationship between talents, um, genius, even criminality, and the, the morphology of the brain. So that's a very specific thing that's a kind of jacket copy that gets written uh, about you just to, to draw people in, um, which is fine with me because, um, I mean, it only takes me a, a few minutes to go back and review this material and become the expert on elite brain collections around the world. So it's only in that sense, though, that, um, yeah, that's true. I, some of that old copy. When I mention the title of this talk, you, you have, really have to be aware of deadlines. Because sometimes you'll put something out there, and without you realizing it, a deadline has been passed, and suddenly that's written in stone. This happens on the internet now. So when you write a short bio for someone as part of a proposal, you're going to try to play up a few things. And you might not want them on the final book or on the final publicity materials, but quite often it winds up there. So this business of my doing statistical research with neuroscience applications, well, that's kind of old news at this point. I'm not doing that now. Um, I only did that for a little while. <laughs> so you have this Frankensteinian story here that his brain was dropped on the laboratory floor and they just swept up the fragments and threw them in the trash. And that really is the legend and when it was published in the Phila this article came out in 1907 and in the Philadelphia newspapers they went wild. Who did this? Who's responsible? The Wistar Institute of Anatomy, who dropped the brain? It's a shame he left his brain to science. He was a great man. Well, you know, you start digging, and I researched extensively the last weeks of his life, which are recorded in great detail by Horace Traubel, who was his, somewhat his assistant and his amanuensis at that point. And the scene is perfectly well described of these scientists, these anatomists, coming to the house on Mickle Street and without permission, removing the brain and putting it into what they call the gup sack. So a gup sack is basically a gutta percha sack and the brain goes into it with some fluid and they take it away and that's the last the brain is heard of. Somehow it does get weighed, maybe it gets preserved. The whole story is very strange. Um, was it destroyed at the Wistar Institute? Seems very unlikely. So I tracked all this stuff down. The Wistar building did not exist yet. It very likely went to Logan Hall on the Penn campus where I had my English classes in my first year and uh, probably disappeared from there. So we don't know much for sure. My conjecture is this whole kind of story, the dropped brain, um, could very well have gone into Frankenstein. Remember, that story is not in the novel. Igor does not go out in the novel and find a brain. Okay, that's the 1933 film. And that scene was added by, oh, I forget his name, the producer of the movie wanted that in there. So you have this legend, this kind of, I mean, that's an urban legend, Walt Whitman's brain. And then um, I guess it grows into these other legends. Frankenstein. Yes? In today's world, could you name three brains that you think should be preserved? <laughs> oh, brains that have not yet been preserved, you mean? <laughs> yeah, interesting question. Um, I, you know, I, it's easy to get facetious about something like that, but my, my inclination would be to say, that um, the brains that probably should be preserved and studied that actually might reveal anything are being preserved and studied, which is um, athletes who suffer from chronic traumatic encephalopathy, for one thing. The most interesting development, though, which I do discuss in the book, is brains of musicians. People who are musically trained, it turns out, do have anatomical differences that seem to develop early in life, that the um, that the gyre, then the temporal gyrus, the area is responsible for auto, um, hearing and um, well, there seems to be, and voice are particularly well developed. 
And so there is a legitimate question there whether someone without that development or has not produced that, say by adulthood, can really be a top-notch classical musician. Um, of course, the fact is, uh, it, uh, with your question, it doesn't need to be done anymore. In other words, brains can be studied in vivo. You don't need to pull them out and put them in formaldehyde, which shrinks them anyway and distorts a few things. So, uh, and the cellular investigations that were done in the 1920s and 30s, for example, on Lenin's brain. I did go to Moscow, to the Moscow Brain Institute. So there's Lenin's brain, 10,000 slices mounted on um, microscope slides. Stalin's also. And then a whole host of them that haven't been sliced up yet. It's like a pantheon of Soviet history because you didn't have to leave your brain to science. They were going to take it. <laughs> Anyway, and they did, and they had literally what they called the Pantheon of Brains, which is now in the Moscow Brain Institute. I describe it in the book. Um, but anyway, Sakharov was the last one collected for that uh, institute. Yes? Yeah, maybe there was recent advancements in neuroscience with neurogenesis, the production of new neurons, and neuroplasticity will help Mm -hmm. It's sort of like a puzzle and more pieces of it. Um, up until even a couple decades ago, it was thought neurogenesis was impossible, that, the, that you could not produce new nerve cells. But yeah, studies have shown that you can, areas of the brain can be retrained and uh, develop slightly, not a lot. Uh, but yeah, it's a very interesting area of research. Yes? Um, yeah, so the question is, how do I make complex science accessible? And I mean, that really is the challenge. So I'll, I'll say a couple things about that. One is that Adam Bellow told me in writing this book, he said, don't ever dumb down science writing. You know, your audience will come to you and they will, they'll, they'll make the effort. Um, at the same time, though, you can't, well, let me give you an example. Um, Burton Ruscha used to write for the New Yorker magazine back in, well, probably the 50s, you know, up into the 60s, and he wrote um, about medicine. And if you go back and you read his articles, you'd see they'd be out of place today, and they're very technical, the language he uses. And I could see where the layperson would have a lot of difficulty reading those things. So you have to strike this kind of balance, um, and you have to define things as you go along use metaphor, that sort of stuff. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of specific examples in any of these. So, you know, we have these three books here. I, first I did the brain book, and then Alan and I did these two books. And this is a problem. I mean, just neurology. What is neurology? Most people tend to confuse all these words that have neuro as a prefix. You know, neuroscience, neurology, neurosurgery. They all get blended together. So. Um, one of the things I do as a teacher, you know, I teach math and I teach statistics also and statistics has a very specific vocabulary in which they use ordinary everyday words like bias, um, significance, but they have a very specific meaning within that subject. And so a lot of your task, at least in the first part of the semester, is to lay out the vocabulary so that everyone's talking a common language, uh, it, words and in concepts. So I try to do the same thing in books. I mean, it helps an awful lot to lecture every day and get in the habit of that and say, because look, in my memory, going back to my college days, there is a tendency of a lot of professors to want to use the big words and not necessarily bring people along with them as though they're saying, well, you're going to have to meet me over here. And my feeling is, no, I'm going to meet you over here and I'm gonna make all these terms accessible. 
So, and the other thing you have to do is you have to do it through repetition. You can't assume in a class or even in a book that if you mention something once, everyone's got it. So those are some of the things I do. Mm -hmm. uh, cat scan of the head. Did, you, did you talk about that? Did you With respect to the elite brains yeah. and so on? No, not really, because um, brain scans are one of his pet peeves. In other words, brain scans are a great diagnostic tool. So if you're a neurologist and you want to find evidence of stroke, you want to look at tumors and so on, you can get these three-dimensional pictures and you can know what's going on. The problem occurs when you do functional MRI. So in other words, you look at the brain at work and you see which areas light up. And what you have to understand about that is it's highly statistical. And that back in the laboratory, someone is taking that data and they are setting parameters which show up as colors on the screen. And they'll say, well, look at this activity over here in the hippocampus or something like that. And we think this is related to well, I mean, it gets very specific, and they begin to say, well, okay, here is where love of mother is located, here's where religiosity is located, and what you get is a new phrenology, basically. So this is one of the things he has a problem with, the idea that you can undergo a brain scan and someone tell, can say if you are lying, or what you are thinking about, or what kind of mind you have, and that's just not the case. So yes, we would go to the radiology lab and we would look at all the x-rays and the scans and whatnot, but no, usually there's a pathologist there and he is saying, see those cells? Okay, so uh, those are metastatic cells and they are spe spreading into this glioma and this patient is not going to live more than another two months. That's the kind of thing that we did. Any other questions? Yes? all of us are aware of what's happening to the brains of not only young people, but all of us who are on our phones and cell phones and distraction and this self-created ADHD. Any thoughts for you? I know there are people doing books on this, but any thoughts for you of that as a next step project? Um, no, not really. I, you know, I, there are these three books on the brain, and I'm, I have a feeling that, for me, is the end of the line when it comes to neuroscience. Um, you know, once again, it comes down to this question uh, about writing a book proposal. You know, what's going to sell? And I was a little bit glib about that, and I don't want to make it sound all that easy. Um, and, you know, you have to think about this sort of thing very carefully. I have to admit, when Alan said, let's book, do a book about neurosyphilis, we talked over a bunch of other ideas, but I ended up writing this up. So, you know, I wrote the proposal. And we sent it in, and my hope, my hope was we would get a very small advance, and I would say, it's not worth it. <laughs> and uh, we wouldn't have to write that book. And unfortunately, apparently, I did too good a job because they offered us an amount of money we couldn't refuse. I mean, really. I, don't, I mean, I'm still mystified by this. Sometimes I go back and I read these book proposals. And I don't really, I, except for the words we live by, I don't really understand what, really, you're giving us money for this? But, you know, they have to turn out books. And they know not all of them are going to make money. But in this case, I think they thought it was going to make a lot of money. And as is somewhat daunting. Uh, and then you're stuck. You sign the contract, you get the first check. Okay, what do we do now? <laughs> well, <laughs> the next thing you know, you're doing a 36-hour trip to Paris just to see one painting and that sort of thing. So I, I don't know. I'm, I don't have anything in the works right now uh, except crossword puzzles and Sudoku and whatnot. And I don't know, you know what might come next. Yes? You've obviously given a lot of thought to education from primary on, on up. Um, do you have some observations on how education has changed in the past 50 or 60 years? 
uh, observations on how education has changed in the past 50 years. <clears throat> um, when you hang out with people in my department, of course, there's always this common strain that, um, that things are different than they were 10, 20, 30 years ago when I started teaching out at UMass. I've also taught, by the way, as low as the sixth grade level and up through pretty much all the grades of um, high school. And, but mainly I see college students and um, yeah, there are all these complaints these days about attention spans and about cell phones and about distractions and all of that. Um, I, I will say though that the students, well, okay, I have to hedge this. Yeah, I do have an observation about this. And it has to do with the educational testing service. So I, I hate to put on my curmudgeonly hat here, but um, I recall in high school that we took PSATs and then we took SATs. As far as I can recall, among all my classmates, we didn't prepare for these things at all. You just signed up, uh, you paid the money, and then one day, well, okay, maybe you got the booklet and you read the instructions in the booklet, and then you just got out a pencil and you took the test. And then there were achievement tests, more or less the same thing, but you had to pay for those. Um, and that was that. Now, my students today take, well, a lot of them take the AP test, calculus, the AB calculus test or the BC calculus test. Some of them come in with a four or five on the AB calculus test and they really struggle. And I've come to learn that that test means absolutely nothing. That they are teaching for that test in the high school instead of teaching math. There's a difference. The students who take the BC test can place out a first year calculus and usually they're okay. My senior year calculus class at Lexington High School was essentially BC calculus. And I did take the achievement test and I placed out of it the first year at Penn. It was very good instruction. It used Thomas's classic calculus textbook back then. So the AP system, these students are coming in with all these AP credits. It says to me that they are being taught to the tests. They're not, I think, getting this rather broad sort of background, which I think is a shame. Um, and by the way, well, <laughs> I even thought it was a shame when I came out of high school, I remember, thankfully, uh, Mrs. Ferlin's Madame Goldberg and, um, oh, what was her name? Um, my other French teacher who said, no, you have to take French next year, you can't stop. So I kept taking um, French and I was very thankful for that, except I took the achievement test in French, which was a huge mistake because I got somewhere in the 700s and it meant that when I got to Penn, I had fulfilled my language requirement. And so I didn't take language, which I thought was a huge mistake. Um, so those things, yeah, I mean, you know, students, I think, are more or less the same. It's the educational systems that change around them. And grand, yes, social media has some effect. Um, and, I, and I guess that's what I see, this move away from books. That's what I liked about Mr. Hathaway's classroom. You know, it's not like we read a lot of the books in Mr. Hathaway's classroom. They were adult books. We were in fourth grade, but they were there and we would look through them. We would see titles, we would see cover art, we would, you know, we would, well, okay, we'd go through the James Bond novels to find the dirty parts, that sort of thing, you know, and that does something for you. So, you know, I, and I sometimes think, gee, I, you know, they wouldn't allow that today. They wouldn't allow that to happen. Did you have the great books that you had to read? Because we had to read The Red Badge of Courage, I think, in the uh, fifth grade. Oh, I'm, well, yes, I mean, we read the assortment of things, but I will say what we learned, we, we learned how to use the library because we were at Hancock where they'd walk us down there every week. We learned how to use a card catalog. We learned how to use a dictionary. We learned how to use a thesaurus and encyclopedia, you know, the world book encyclopedia, the Americana, that sort of thing. And that's another thing that I notice today is gone. Okay, we learned how to alphabetize. I'm not so sure that kids today learn how to alphabetize. How would they? And we learned how to write. And, well, and, Mr. Murray. Yeah, well, Mr. Murray, Miss Benavich, she was a strunken white, 
acolyte. She taught me a lot of things about what not to do. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, well, I'm going to go to the table at the back and sign books if you are interested, and I want to thank you again for coming out this evening.